Welcome to our webinar on LMT by Celebs. I'm Dorothea Thomas Anjola and Gerhard Backfried and Erin Dikici will tell you some words about LMT. And maybe I will have just some questions. Hi everyone, uh, this is Gerhard. I'm the head of research here at Celebs. I've been with Celebs for more than 20 years. It's my second millennium with the company uh, and I'm the research uh, uh, group here at Sail Labs. Hello everyone, I'm Erin Stikiji, uh, working for Sail Labs uh, as a speech scientist. Uh, I've been responsible for training acoustic and language models for ASR. And together we're here today to tell you a little bit what happens when your vocabulary runs away. So let's start a little bit with uh, the context of our webinar today. We'll be talking about the media mining system in a larger context. And to give you that context, uh, the slide gives you a little bit of an impression of how complex our system is. There are some uh, feeding, uh, some ingestion mechanisms and components that you can see on the left. And we usually call those the media mining feeders. Uh, there is the media mining indexer that entails all sorts of enrichment technologies, some operating on audio, some operating on text, some operating on visual elements such as still images or videos. Um, there is a large backend where all of this information is stored for later querying, for search and so on. And uh, there are also different play out uh, components where users can interact with the system. So there are lots of different technologies and models involved. Can you explain how and where the LMT and Kava play a role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the LMT and Kava, which are the two technologies that we'll be talking about, uh, they have to do with vocabularies and how to change vocabularies, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, those two actually concern only a small box. It's a small box here, but it's a large box with regards to the technologies that are behind it. Uh, we'll be focusing on the audio processing components and in particular on the automatic speech recognition component, turning audio into a set of written words. I get, you know, sometimes people mistake transcription and translation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Could you explain the difference and what's actually taking place in SR? Yeah, yeah, that's actually, it's a very good question. And it's true that sometimes, so I just said automatic speech recognition, but sometimes people call it translation. Sometimes people call it transcription. Um, for us, speech recognition turns audio in one language into a set of sequence of words in the same language. So we refer to that as transcription. Translation for us would mean taking content, maybe written content in one language, and turning it into another language. So maybe some text in English and turning it into German, for example. So here we're talking strictly about transcription. Speech yeah. recognition is transcription. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. So typically what, what happens, uh, our system gets used in uh, media observation uh, scenarios. Uh, we have a newscast, we have an anchor speaker, and she's starting uh, tonight's news show with good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we hear and that's what we believe. But when you take a look at the audio, and this is a, a, an image of the audio file that was produced, what you can see is that there are other things happening as well. The speaker didn't really say good evening, comma, ladies and gentlemen, exclamation mark. But what she really said was good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So there might be a lip smack at the beginning, at the onset of the sentence, there might be breathing noise in the audio at the beginning or in the middle. And uh, there are also no commas or exclamation marks. There's no punctuation. So really the audio stream and uh, the stream representing what was said is not quite the same as written language. And those are all things that the automatic speech recognition also has to deal with. We have lip smacking and breathing noises in the audio. And we also need to recognize those and we need to do something with those. And then uh, maybe filter them out and, and, and disregard them. And then we're ending up with a set of words and those words get transcribed. 
So uh, automatic speech recognition tries to turn uh, an audio file, an audio stream into a sequence of words. But what actually happens uh, during that process, Erich? So if you look at the SR system as a black box, it is actually inside uh, something as complicated as uh, this. Uh, but of course, if you look into details, uh, we can see that the NASR system is made up of several components. So one of those components is the acoustic model, uh, which basically converts uh, sounds to phones or phonemes of a language. We use uh, the state-of-the-art uh, neural network modeling, uh, deep learning methods uh, for uh, acoustic modeling in our system. And the second component is the language model, which basically uh, tries to convert words, individual words, into sequences of words so that we get the resulting uh, transcription of the utterance. And what's the gap between the both components? Yeah, the gap. Uh, yes, we need something to actually combine, uh, connect the acoustic model to the language model from phones to words. And this is uh, the pronunciation model, as I will explain in the next slide. So what we actually need for an ASR system is a well-built language model, a vocabulary list of words with their spellings and their pronunciations. The language model is a probabilistic model of word sequences. It is not a grammar, and this is so for a reason. People do not often speak uh, in uh, grammatically correct and complete sentences, and the language model has to take care of this. And for the vocabulary, the spellings, we need them uh, because uh, the way uh, the tokenization uh, uh, is applied in different languages affects uh, the result that we get in the end. And for pronunciations, of course, it depends uh, differs from language to language, dialect to dialect. Uh, there is a standard set of phone sets, uh, which is defined in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Uh, you can find, uh, see an example uh, of this in uh, the picture. Uh, and we, in our system, we select a subset of these uh, for a particular language and make use of these pronunciations. Is the vocabulary a fixed set of words? How does one decide what should be part of the vocabulary and what should be left out? Uh, well, the, the vocabulary is uh, indeed normally a fixed set of words. Uh, it depends on the domain, of course, and on the language. Uh, it depends on the structure of the language, and it can be uh, something small for dialogue setups, maybe. It can be something rather large. It could be 50,000, 100,000, to 400,000 different uh, full forms of, of words. Won't there always be new words which are not in the vocabulary? but which are important. Take, for example, the word COVID. A few months ago, no one even had an idea that this word existed. And now everybody uses it all the time. Yeah, that, that's very, very true. And uh, uh, there's one point about automatic speech recognition systems. Uh, unlike a child, uh, when you're using a new word, uh, they may ask, what does it mean? And, and how's it pronounced really and so on. Unlike humans, human, humans will ask for that. A speech recognition system will not be able to recognize any word that it doesn't have in its vocabulary. Um, and uh, the vocabulary, as you, as you correctly said, always changes. One day, nobody knows COVID. The next day, everybody talks about it. Um, years ago, nobody knew the word Brexit because it didn't exist. And now everybody knows the word Brexit. Um, so there's a shift in vocabularies. There's a new company popping up. There's a new politician entering the stage or involved in some sort of scandal. Uh, and everybody talks about it. They're in the news constantly. And this change, this shift is actually what uh, made us long time ago already want to be able to let ourselves, our partners, our end users, be able to influence the vocabulary. And this is how the language model toolkit came into existence. The language model toolkit 
uh, is depicted uh, in this graph, and, and maybe Aaron wants to uh, explain what those individual elements uh, actually mean. So with the language model toolkit, we allow the users to build their own language models and customize for their own use cases. Uh, we uh, provide the users uh, our own vanilla models for all languages, and they're all working fine. Uh, but if they would like to add new words uh, or adapt uh, to different uh, domains, topics, they can use the language model toolkit. So in this case, uh, the user uh, can add text files, vocabularies, a list of words, and also uh, dictionaries. I mean, the pronunciations of uh, the spellings of those words uh, into the language model toolkit. And the language model toolkit uh, applies text pre-processing, uh, pronunciation generation if the user doesn't provide them. And finally, trains the language model, uh, which gets deployed into uh, the media mining server uh, within one click and uh, distributed to uh, all the machines that are running uh, like my media mining indexer. Can anyone use the LMT or do you need any specific knowledge or training? Basically, anyone with the appropriate level of training can use LMT. Uh, we have uh, many partners, customers uh, already using uh, LMT uh, for their own uh, use cases. And uh, we at Say Labs uh, already provide the basic knowledge of LMT with uh, trainings. And right after these slides, uh, we will uh, present the, how the language model toolkit works. Some of this seems to require human intervention, but some parts can probably be automated, at least to some extent, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, there is um, quite a bit of human intervention here. Uh, the training, as Aaron already said, is uh, not too much. It's a couple of days, maybe, but you're right. Uh, and uh, this is why we developed the LMT further into something that we call Kava, the Continuous Automatic Vocabulary Adaptation. And what do we mean by that? If you remember the first slide, uh, you had these ingestion components on the left-hand side, web crawlers, uh, and we're using the same technologies to collect data from the web every day, continuously, from sources uh, that we trust, sources that we know are relevant to us, to our users and partners. And from these sources, what we try to learn is new vocabulary that pops up and that is relevant. So something, for example, that is talked about across a set of sources uh, many times of high frequency and with a high recency yesterday and not a month ago, uh, usually is more important or more relevant than something that was said a long time ago or that's only said a couple of times or mentioned only a couple of times. So what we have done is we have combined our ingestion mechanisms, the web collector in this case, and created a framework. Uh, the framework uh, has some heuristics, some guidelines in it that help the system choose automatically which words should be added to the vocabulary because they're relevant today and presumably they will also be relevant tomorrow. And why is this important? Because when they're said on TV, uh, we said before, nothing can get recognized correctly if it's not in the vocabulary. Well, here we have a case of the real world, the media in this case, teaching us in a way what might be relevant tomorrow. And Kava learns from this automatically what might be good words to include in the dictionary, in the vocabulary for a model. We use the LMT as a backend. The LMT builds the model. It does some uh, testing. Uh, it's called out of vocabulary perplexity calculation here. Basically, those are tests that allow us to say uh, a newly and automatically built model is ready for deployment. It, it passes some quality tests, I would say. And then we deploy these models to the media mining system. The media mining server uh, distributes them to all of the indexers in a group. And the indexers just reload the models. And from that very moment on, uh, they're now able to transcribe uh, a new word correctly. So if we learn the word Brexit or the word COVID, uh, 
just a couple of hours later, the system is able to correctly transcribe it as well. And uh, uh, this can come from text. It can come from vocabularies with pronunciations. If users have additional knowledge about the pronunciations, and uh, it also states profiles and ontologies, and that's a, a minor thing here, but in practice, it's also very relevant because those profiles are linked to the detection of named entities and everything that gets added to the profiles uh, is added for a reason, presumably. The, the user thinks it's something important, something relevant. So we also consider these profiles to become part of the process. And also these profiles will be able to be recognized correctly uh, when they go through all of this process. Gerhard, is all of this being used in practice or only in the lab? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, we have been working on this scheme for some time. Uh, first, within the scope of research projects, which is a very common approach for us. We, we go new paths and uh, go new places in the way in a research project, try to make it work. From this, we had it in a development environment for some time. And now we've been using this environment for several languages for uh, over a year easily uh, here at Salabs. So every night um, at 10 o'clock, these uh, mechanisms are started automatically. And in the morning when we come back, they have built new models, they have created them, distributed them, and they're being used. And uh, some people here are informed about the new vocabulary that has been included, which is also important first of us for, for us to know uh, what has been added uh, as a sort of a sanity check. But it's also uh, very interesting to read through this list because really what happens is very current topics pop up in these, uh, in these emails that we get sent every morning. So we sort of know what new things are coming up on the horizon. So it has uh, many different uh, implications and many different uses, but uh, the system is actually a product. Uh, it has been deployed. It's ready for deployment. It's being used and uh, uh, it's uh, not a research prototype. It's an actual product. Where will things be moving next? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, um, if you remember the slide that Erin presented on the acoustic models and on the language model, you will see that the Kava framework uh, aims at improving the vocabulary, the pronunciations, the language model. It's on this side. Uh, and it's, it's doing a very good job at it. But the acoustic models the, that we use uh, are basically static. They have been trained from a large variety of data that's also representative of the domain. And of course, with every language and every dialect, this changes. Well, we've done a lot of work on that. But uh, new ways that we're exploring now also concern the acoustic models and how in the world of acoustic modeling, we might be able to also establish some similar workflow that we have here for Kava, for the language model toolkit and the vocabulary, also for the audio. So uh, develop a, a framework and a system that automatically is able to learn from new audio and extend or make its own models more robust with regard to change in the audio. So I think a, a, a nice and, and a good new step and extension of this framework would be from the uh, language model and vocabulary side towards the acoustic side of things. And of course, we're also constantly improving and adding new languages uh, to our uh, repository. Uh, we support 25 languages for ASR, most of uh, which support LMT already, and we will continue doing so in the near future. Let's now have a look how the LMT works. And then we can see if we have questions from the audience. Automatic speech recognition or speech to text is the technology employed to convert spoken words into a sequence of written words, making multimedia content manageable and searchable. Today's state-of-the-art systems typically use a fixed set of words, their pronunciations, and a model of how these words are combined in the transcription process converting audio into text. For example, 
Let's take a look at Theresa May talking about the Brexit. Well, I couldn't be clearer. Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. These are systems typically employ a static vocabulary, which means that they cannot recognize new or unknown words on the fly. In order to be able to recognize these words, the vocabulary has to be extended. Thanks to the Salebs Language Model Toolkit, or LMT, you can add such missing or new words to the vocabulary with minimal effort and build new models for ASR. Several steps need to be carried out using the LMT to produce a model which can later be used for transcription. Using the LMT and a set of files mentioning the word or words of interest, an updated model for ASR can be built. Text samples mentioning the word of interest can be collected from the internet or internal resources. These texts provide examples of how the new words are typically used in the real world. The input files are analyzed regarding their content. The text is cleaned of any unnecessary sections such as formatting information and new or unknown words are detected, will thus be recognized and marked as being a new word of interest. Any new words detected require one or more pronunciations in order to be recognized when said. These pronunciations form the link between the audio, the pronunciation of the respective words in a TV program, and the word itself. The model can now be built and the resulting model can be installed and used on a system where the Media Mining Indexer, Sales ASR system, is installed. Once installed, the new model can be used for transcription. Well, I couldn't be clearer. Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. Using the LMT, it is thus possible to quickly and efficiently extend and adapt models for ASR, for example, by including new and previously unknown words such as the word Brexit. Using these models for transcription yields improved performance for transcription from different types of media. A special course on how to effectively use the LMT is offered by Salems. Thank you for watching. Let's see if we have uh, questions uh, from the audience. Okay, we have the first question. Mm. What about emoji as a new evolving language in a written form? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the question. Maybe I take this one. Um, and I would also actually interpret it as a bit broader, not only emojis, but maybe youth language or teenage slang in general. Uh, when I listen to how my kids talk or when I see what they type on WhatsApp, um, it's very different from the type of language we normally use. Um, with regard to the LMT and, and to automatic speech recognition, these are things that aren't typically said. I mean, people say lol or they say sick or whatever, but they don't say smiley or whatever. It's, it's rather written and it's typically written in Telegram style in platforms that only allow for short messages. So when it comes to text processing and let's say to sentiment analysis in text, emojis play a very important role. And emojis are actually also culture dependent because the emojis in the Western world use the mouth basically to convey emotion, whereas uh, in Japan or in China, um, the eyes are used uh, more frequently to convey the same meaning. So emojis are also culture dependent or language dependent, if you like. With regard to youth language in uh, spoken styles, it's relevant for us with regard to particular platforms. So if we transcribe something from YouTube, for example, and it depends, of course, on the types of channel and the types of content, but let's say it's some sort of a stylish, youth style type of content, then we also train, or we would have to train specific models. And those specific models would use different types of uh, vocabulary and expressions that are maybe not standard. Uh, they don't correspond to the standard style of speaking. And uh, our approach would be to have a base language model for a particular language and maybe on top have particular expressions from particular domains, let's say about computer games, then we would, we would need the names of the games, of course, but we would also need all that slang that goes with computer gaming. And uh, that can actually also be fed in the LMT, would be provided as a particular vocabulary, probably as a dictionary, because these things tend to have acronyms and then you have to be an insider to know how the acronym is really pronounced. So it's a spelling and, and pronunciation or more pronunciations. And that would be an input file uh, or an input set of files to the LMT and we would create a particular model and that model would then be better able, for example, to transcribe uh, YouTube videos talking about new video games. 
Thank you very much, Gerhard. The next question is, which languages support LMT or Kava? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can answer that. So uh, we have uh, run more than, I think, 10 languages uh, which, uh, with which we support LMT. Um, the, the common European languages, English, German, French, Spanish, Italian, um, Arabic is one of them, Urdu, Pashto, uh, and a few more, um, I guess Russian. Um, so those with those, we have the LMT support. And as I already uh, told, uh, we're constantly improving and adding new features and LMT is definitely one of them. So we will continue adding LMT support for all the other languages. And Kava uh, inherently also, uh, since it's based on LMT, uh, it also uh, is supported uh, in those languages that I uh, mentioned. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, the next question we have is, how long does it take to train a language model? Maybe I can also answer that question. Um, well, it depends on the use case, of course, the, the, and the vocabulary size and complexity of the model uh, that the user needs. Um, very constrained language models uh, can be built within a language, in, within a minute or two, actually. Uh, but more complex language models, say with uh, 100,000 plus words uh, and uh, more uh, like intellectually, morphologically rich languages can take uh, more than 20 minutes, uh, I would say. And, uh, but, but let me say that this is, this is all on a standard uh, desktop or laptop. So uh, we don't need any supercomputers. To, uh, computer language models, and uh, well, the most important part is the memory of the uh, 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 processing environment, of course. But other than that, uh, it's just a simple operation. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is, uh, what do you teach in an LMT course? Can we unmute the heart? Yes, sorry about that. It was uh, it was muted. Um, what do we teach in an MTV class? Well, um, I think we try to convey a little bit about the background of uh, speech recognition technology in general. Uh, why? Because we believe it's always better to have the context uh, of why people are using the LMT, what effects it has, uh, how it helps, where it's beneficial, and maybe also where the limits are, because you cannot do everything and anything with the LMT, of course. So typically, we provide a little bit of the background. We make people aware of the intricacies of languages, of the difficulties that we encounter, um, because we as humans are super ESR systems. We understand speech in a lot of different contexts with background noise. Think of yourself out on the street with a friend walking down, trucks are rolling by. Uh, there's lots of noise and still you can talk to each other. You have a lot of context, a shared context that helps. Speech recognition systems have problems with these settings. So it's good to know what the context is. Um, we tell people a little bit about how to help the speech reco system, what it means to select a vocabulary, how to best tell if a word is reasonable, is good, is helpful to be in a vocabulary, and what things better shouldn't go into a vocabulary. Uh, what problems may occur, how to actually do the building, how to run and operate the LMT. It has a GUI. Uh, there's also a command line version for people who would like to integrate it. The more techie people might want to do it that way. Uh, so we teach that as well. And uh, then also to test the system, how to evaluate it. You know, how do you know it does what you want it to do? Um, and, and what is a good way of, of uh, going about this measuring? That's also part. Uh, very often, I would say it's a couple of days, and usually we go into the actual building as quickly as we can, and we are happier the more our end users bring their own data. We have some samples and we build things and we can demonstrate and show the beneficial effects, but there's nothing like running it on real data. So people bringing end users, partners, customers bringing their own data, then developing jointly with us a model that's much better than the original one, uh, that's always a very nice uh, experience during LMT trainings. 
Thank you, Gerhard. The next question is, do I need help from a phonetics expert or linguist to define the correct pronunciation for the system? Maybe I can also uh, answer this one. Um, I would say yes and no. The, um, there is a phonetic alphabet. Erin, I think, explained this before also. And uh, the bridge between the spelling of a word and the acoustics is a pronunciation or a set of pronunciations. And you need to be sort of fluent in this vocabulary to translate things. On the other hand, we're not forensics experts. We're not linguists in the sense that we go out and find the last little detail of how different dialects, how different social um, strata of a population uses, pronounces a different word. So I think a, a general level of uh, phonetics is a good thing. Having a phonetician, we've had the uh, phoneticians in our classes and they said, you know, one day they came up and said, I found 21 different ways of pronouncing one word, one word. And we said this might linguistically might be very interesting and very valid, but for practical purposes, maybe one or two is sufficient. So having somebody with linguistic knowledge a little bit uh, is a good thing, but you certainly don't have to be linguists or phonetics expert. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, how do I know if the newly built model is better than the previous one? Maybe I can answer that, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me say, the user cannot break the base model. The base model, as I, we have shown in the, in the slide uh, that we provide to our uh, users, uh, they cannot break it. So it uh, not only acts as a base uh, for other uh, language models, but also acts as a uh, fallback scenario, let's say. Um, for user-built models, though there are like several uh, methods, we have also uh, shown that in the, uh, in the Kava slide. One is uh, the out of vocabulary rate. Basically, it checks uh, how many of the words in a test document uh, our language model contains. Uh, so the ones which do not appear uh, are called the out of vocabulary. Um, and the second one is the perplexity. Uh, perplexity is, well, basically a measure of uh, how well the language model is trained or how well it is able to predict uh, upcoming words, new words. So that is another thing. Uh, those checks are regularly done uh, when a new language model is built using the Kava and compared against the previous one, uh, so that uh, the perplexity has to be lower at the out of vocabulary of rate uh, as well. So uh, these are uh, certain checks. And one additional thing would be to calculate again, uh, the, to apply the language model on the ASR uh, system and check the uh, word error rate. Uh, so that is basically uh, the, the percentage of words misrecognized by the SR uh, on, on a standard test set. Thank you very much. Um, so far we have the last two questions. Um, one is which operating system or systems does the MMI or LMT work with? Shall I answer that one as well? Maybe you can add, add later, go ahead. So basically the graphical user interface of the language model toolkit uh, is based on Windows systems. Uh, but as Gerhard mentioned, uh, all of this in the background is actually script-based, mostly Perl. So any uh, computer that can run uh, those scripts uh, is able to run LMT on a command line basis. And, and I could add to that, the, uh, whereas uh, you may train a model on the Windows system, the, the transcription, the speech recognizer, the ASR system, the ASR component, which we call the media mining indexer, uh, that exists in the Windows world as well as in the Linux world. And the models that are created with the NMT are binary identical. So you can create a model on the Windows machine and you can deploy it on a Linux machine and it would still run the same way it runs on a Windows machine. So speech reco exists on Linux and on Windows. Models are binary identical. The LMT building itself using the GUI that takes place on Windows only. 
Thank you very much. And the last question so far is, do we need a license to run the LMT? Uh, maybe we, we didn't really go into licensing here. Um, the uh, speech reco itself to run it requires a license. Uh, so anybody wanting to use our speech recognition has to have a valid license for a particular language. Either you're able to run it for English or German or for all languages and there are different licenses and license models available. To run the LMT and to build a model does not require any type of license. So it's installed on a machine and on that machine it can be built, deployed, and then when you test it, testing means actually transcribing, running speech recognition. That's the part where a license is required, just like a license to transcribe normal audio into text. And uh, uh, this is a particular license flag in our world, but it's a particular specific license that's required. So building the models itself does not require license. Applying the models, deploying them and running them in the real world, that does require a regular speech recognition license from SAVAPS. Thank you very much. Uh, these were all the questions that we received. Uh, maybe if still someone has some questions, you can still uh, send it to us and we will contact the research team maybe to additionally answer some questions if someone is interested. And if that's uh, everything, uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar and we hope to see you at our next event, which is planned for the 28th of October. The next topic will be the US elections with two external guests, Professor Peter Cochrane and Mr. Karl Heinz Land. Here you have the, have the link uh, where you can find the, the registration form. The registration is for free and it would be very nice to, to see you again. We hope you like this webinar. And again, please feel free to contact us anytime with some questions or queries. Thank you very much and have a nice day.